Dean's great. I mean, Dean will look like he's 29, I think, for another 20 years. Uh, <laughs> you know, and honestly, I've seen him. I've sat at him at dinners, uh, and he eats so clean. He doesn't even order soda. I mean, it's, it's tremendous. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We are in season three, coming to you live with face-to-face -face interviews. And the beautiful thing about this is I've managed to actually track down some of these guys who are almost impossible to get hold of to interview. And we are coming from Berlin today. We're at the International Meeting of Rhinoplasty Societies. And I've got somebody who I've had my eye on wanting to get on the podcast for a while, finally right here in the studio with me. Ash Gavami, welcome to the episode. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. This is going to be fun. So when I was asking you how's the best way to pronounce your surname, you said it should be like Salami. Eh? Yes. Well, because people say Gavani, Giovanni. So it's Gavami and it sounds like Salami as far as the syllables. So yeah. Ash Gavami. Ash Khan is my first name, but yeah. everyone calls me Ash, all my friends. Yeah. Awesome. So the, the podcast listen all around the world. Oh, okay. Tell, tell the listeners a little bit about who you are and where do you come from? What do you spend sure. most of your time doing? Yeah, so I grew up in Los Angeles, California in the United States. And, uh, you know, I did all my training actually outside of California. I did university yeah. in uh, Newport Beach area, which is like about an hour and a half south. Okay. And then after that, uh, I went ahead to med school in Ohio. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, to Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and then which was a great freezing place, but a major, a major college town, so very fun. Yeah. Did my medical school there, did extra time in anatomy, studying anatomy there, wrote some papers. And then I went and matched into plastic surgery uh, at Case Western in Cleveland, and then finished off at UT Southwestern with Rod Rorick, Jack Gunter, John Tebbett, Sam Hamra, all the big greats, Fritz Barton. Yeah. Yeah. So I was at UT Southwestern in Dallas during what's considered like one of the golden areas, yeah. golden eras of yeah, yeah. Dallas. And at the time, I really do feel like it was probably the best training program in the world. And it was heavily focused on rhinoplasty, as you know, yeah. with Jack Gunter and Rod Rorick running the Dallas Rhinoplasty meeting. Now, I think it's approaching 50 years. I mean, it's been around for a long yeah, time. Yeah. So, um, so I did a lot of rhinoplasty research there. I wrote uh, the first ever Middle Eastern rhinoplasty chapter in the famous yeah. Dallas rhinoplasty textbook. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I would spend my weekends at Starbucks writing chapters, articles, delving into rhinoplasty, spending time in the cadaver lab before and after the meeting because there's yeah. a big cadaver portion. So we had access to all these cadavers. We could do all these studies. I did studies on you know the fat compartments ligaments of the face and nose and the nose and it was amazing tremendous training so when i got out i went back to los angeles to beverly hills yeah. opened up a private practice and then it soon got affiliated with ucla as an assistant professor okay and then right away i was invited back to dallas i think now in the 16th year in a row consecutive i've been faculty in dallas and of course, throughout the years, I've helped with the Aesthetic Society. And so I've been very academically involved. Yeah, yeah. And as you know now, I was privileged to be voted in as the uh, president of the Rhinoplast Society. Yeah. So this meeting is, as people listening might know, Rhinoplast Society of America with the Rhinoplast Society of Europe combined meeting. Yeah. So yeah. Um, representing it as president here. And, uh, you know, it's rhinoplasty has always been very multicultural by definition yep. you're from south africa i spoke to people from nigeria from asia from all the continents because noses are by definition very cultural yep. you know when you do a rhinoplasty you don't want to change anyone's ethnicity make them look awkward or weird yeah, yeah. so i spend a lot of time focusing on this aspect of rhinoplasty and when i grow up i'm persian so i saw my mom my aunts my mom's friends, sometimes two, three in a row with casts on when I was eight years old recovering in our house. Yeah. So for okay. us, it's very normal. And yeah. it's the number one operation in Iran. Yes. So rhinoplasty, for me to do it, it's about 60% of my practice. Okay. I still love body surgery, but 60% yeah. is rhinoplasty. And 
for me, it was such a f- good focus and so important to mix it with ethnic and cultural backgrounds yeah, yeah. and ancestry, and it's fascinated me. I always ask my patients if they know their DNA and where they're from, and I like to know that, and I document it. I'm doing a long-term study on it. Fantastic. And recently, I, me and Sam Mosa and Nazem Cherkis came out with a textbook called Global Rhinoplasty, yeah, yeah. which uh, is, incorporates all of these materials. So. It's a passion of mine. It's a passion of mine to do rhinoplasty. And despite um, the challenges, especially today, yeah. I feel like with social media, which I'm considered to be a big part of, was involved with social media and Instagram a lot longer than uh, longer ago than most people. Yeah, since yeah. 2012. So um, I've been fortunate to have a very high organic following, work with celebrities, but the most difficult, challenging thing now with social media, I think, is that people come in with unrealistic expectations. They use filters on their face. They look at results from the operating room from other people, and they think that can be achieved. As we all know, the nose changes every six months, year, two years, three years, constantly evolves. So I'm constantly having to almost lecture my patients, and I spend almost sometimes 15, 20 minutes talking to these teenagers and these 20 year olds and 25 year olds, even some of the 45, 50 year old mothers and moms yeah. of 10, yeah. Yeah. they come in, they still have unrealistic expectations. Yeah. So it's rhinoplasty is just always evolving. And now yeah. with preservation techniques and everything, it's just um, really important to master not only the techniques, but how to talk to your patients yeah. and how to avoid AI taking over and unrealistic expectations taking yeah. over. And as, as us being here in Berlin, I was just in Clinica Planas in Barcelona, lecturing there. Um, and I have multiple places I'm going to be going. Next yeah. year, we're going to go to Dubai for ASAPs. We have yeah. a meeting. It's very global. It's very international. It's yeah. very multi, I think. So it's great that you're from South Africa and you're doing a podcast with me, and me, Roman, but yeah. in California, yeah. now in Berlin, talking about global rhino. No, it's amazing. So, Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. No, it's fantastic. That's yeah, what the it podcast put, it, is about. Yeah, it put it all in. The less I speak, the yes. better. What has it been like for you in the competitiveness of Beverly Hills? Well, I'll be very honest, and I'm always a straight shooter. Those that yeah. know me very well, and even when I gave my inauguration speech uh, for accepting the presidency of Rhinoplast Society, I was very straightforward. I'm just one of those that's straight. As we say in America, yeah. we shoot from the hip. We yeah. don't mess around. So very honestly, it's it's been a big challenge because I'm passionate about this. I love what I do. But from day one, my competitors that are my age are a little older. And then the senior guys in town, when I came into town, obviously, they're not too happy about it. You know, it's yeah. very ultra competitive. Yeah. So, of course, you get a lot of, you know, we all experience a little bit of professional jealousy. We're all, you know, ambitious, it's overachieving right. type personalities. Yes. If you're going to not be that, you can't really become a surgeon. Yeah. especially not something like a rhinoplasty surgeon because yeah. that's ultra competitive, ultra challenging, yeah. technically very demanding and difficult. It's almost as if you're doing just abstract painting versus trying to do a Rembrandt very accurately. Right? It's a very big difference. So it's more like a Rembrandt. Yeah. Um, and I would say, you know, the talking and the submersive body language and eye contact and the way unsaid and spoken words and consults by competitors said about patients that go to you and the guy down the street, it can be a little bit difficult to deal with. And I've just, what I do is I don't even ask if I'm doing a revision, I don't ask who the previous surgeon was. I, a lot of times don't even ask for the operative record because it doesn't help me too much. But a lot of people don't do that. They go, Oh, you went to Gavami. Hmm, Yeah. You're not the only one, you know, like things like that. I think is very common in places like Los Angeles yeah. and Beverly Hills because it's so competitive. Yeah. And um, I have developed, whether I've liked it or not, it's just happened this way and I'm very fortunate and it's challenging in its own way or not, but I do have a big celebrity uh, clientele and yeah. patient base. And so in their circles, the word gets out, I don't need to market or advertise, yeah. you know, um, but, you know, when people in town know that and they see me posting with a celebrity, it makes them to become even more aggressive with the lingo, like, oh, Gavami, yeah, yeah. You know, so honestly, it's very ultra competitive, but I have thick skin. I trained in Dallas with Rod and Jack Gunter and (laughs) the big giants. So I have like an armor over me um, where, you know, I'm not a permeous and I'm not going to be affected by that. And that's why I've succeeded because I just look straight 
and I do my thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now I'm a part of a fellowship. I just hired an associate. So he's finally going to be helping me because I have such little time to finally, I mean, I have a textbook out and all that, but I really want to get a lot of my ideas down in scientific articles yeah, because yeah. throughout the years, some of the things I've talked about have been copied by people and switched mm-hmm. around and it doesn't bother me too much, but it's honestly my fault for not going through uh, and publishing it right away when yeah. I go speak about it. Yeah. Yeah. So in many ways, our field is just so competitive. It's competitive yeah. among all our peers here where the meeting, it's competitive in your town. But if you can't have the thick skin and you're not, uh, you know, ambitious, successful type yeah. in anything, whether it's a Formula One race car driver, a professional football player, you know, none of these people uh, got to where they were because they were worried about competition. That's it. I love it. Yep. One of, uh, I, I always love some of the different quotes that Rod throws out in the theater in the OR. So he's Cameron, you know, everyone's world famous on their own website. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Like, yeah, yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, we don't ask for things like that, but when it happens, it's nice and it happens over time. You know, I didn't pay for it, buy it. You know, it just I've been around for a while. It's been about 16, 17 years I've been in practice. And from day one, I was right in the same building in Beverly yeah. Hills. Didn't move. So I eventually, you know, it's like a tree. Eventually that tree grows and the roots go deep. 100 yeah. percent. And the more wind. The stronger the root system is. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're right. Wow. You're right. And and so your practice uh, for the listeners, how much of that rhinoplasty? How much of it is other cosmetic surgery, etc.? I would. I mean, it varies uh, month to month. Yeah. Honestly, um, rhinoplasty for me has always been the top, and yeah. it's about sixty percent on average. Okay. Some months it'll be forty or fifty. Some months it'll be eighty. Yeah. Um, the rest of it, I developed a reputation and I also lecture for the Aesthetic Society and around the yeah, world on yeah. safety and fat transfer of the buttocks. So I do a lot of 360 high definition body contouring. So usually when I get invited to lecture, it's rhinoplasty and buttock and body contouring. Okay. But I also do a fair amount of facelifts and eyelid work and things that I don't always lecture about. Yeah. And I do fat transfers all over the face. So yeah. that makes up the other 40%. Yeah. But 60% is almost consistently rhinoplasty. Okay. And then two other things like family life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. I have kids. uh, I have a family and I have a wife and it's a challenge. They're all here with me now. So um, we we did a whole tour of Europe. We started out in Barcelona where I lectured for uh, Planas. I'm I'm sure you know Clinic of Planas. World famous. Beautiful facility there. Huge. Almost like a hospital. Um, and then uh, from that, we did uh, Amsterdam, Brussels. Now we're here, and after here, we're going to go to Paris. So I try to turn my work trips into vacations, right. but sometimes I, I travel solo yeah. also. And so um, on those trips, I cut them a little shorter, but I always try to carve out a little bit of time. Yeah. In yeah. fact, little known secret, I will accept some invitations, places where I haven't been, where I want to make it a vacation. So. I do accept, I do decline certain places I've been a lot or like yeah, yeah. they're like somewhere in the US and but international is hard it's hard to travel international it takes a lot of time away from your family yeah. and your practice yeah. but we need it we need to get away from our practice sometimes it's good for mental health absolutely physician because... well-being is one of my agendas in my one year presidency for rhinoplast society but this is such a hot topic at the moment and something I want to unpack a bit more is this physician wellness yes mental not just mental wellness but physical wellness as well like look after your physical body and i think if there's one person in the world of rhinoplasty who's done incredibly well with that is dean yeah i mean that guy really is very clean yeah yeah dean's great i mean dean will look like he's 29 i think for another 20 years (laughs) you know and honestly i've seen him i've sat at him at dinners uh and he eats so clean he doesn't even order soda I mean, it's, yeah. it's tremendous. I'm, I'm getting better at that. Yeah. Uh, I limited, you know, things that uh, if I, I think about my gut health, my mental health. Um, I weight train. I work out. I'm better some weeks than others. We're all, you know, have t- rough weeks yeah, where yeah, we just yeah. can't even make it to the gym. We can't do one jog. Yeah. But I try to at least do some form of meditation here and there. Yeah. Take time. Go for a walk. Get out in nature. Yeah. I mean... That's what makes us human. You can yeah. really get lost, especially in Beverly Hills. I've seen it happen in competitive markets. Really, yeah. People get lost into their business. And what ends up happening, you end up becoming 
almost um, a slave to your own business. So you end up becoming, the business runs you instead of you running the business, yeah. your staff, your business, and then you're just basically just running around being a part of that machine, whereas you should be the one sitting back operating that machine. So that's one of the biggest challenges, honestly. And it's a catch-22 because we all strive when we're younger to be you know, famous and, and famous enough to get a lot of patience and within, town, within the town have a good reputation, get very busy. And when you do get that busy, the focus on your own wellness uh, can easily just drop down in priority. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not good because we've all seen our mentors and older surgeons walking around hunched over, yeah. artificial hip, their neck doesn't move because they didn't take care of themselves. Yeah. Wow. You surf? <laughs> I, I I feel like South Africa, it's all about water, and so surfing, good. swimming, dodging sharks. <laughs> I, I think we're going to get you to South Africa. Okay. Bring the family for okay. safari. So, okay. no, my background is actually, um, I only, like, a bit later in my life, ended up completing my medical studies and going to specialize because I was a professional Olympic canoeist. Oh, so I did whitewater you... kayaking. Oh, wow. And uh, okay. so I still, I, I, I get onto the ocean and yes. I run trail running and I'm with the kids, we mountain biking. I'm very busy and sporty. Surfing, I've tried it a few times and it's, it's never champ. actually, I mean, our house is, is 100 yards from the yeah. beach. So well, I'm on the beach every day yes, with the yeah. dogs or paddling. But, but surfing's a whole other thing. Quite I just one. assumed. But see, I was not far off. I yeah, yeah. liked water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know Aaron wants to come and surf in South Africa yeah. one day. Yeah. But I'll, I'll pull him out in the boat and, and watch him do it. Nice. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure. Well, Ash, man, it's it's so interesting listening to to how well you've done. And just like what stands out for me is is there's this achievement but there's also like a real deep humility and understanding like a piece about who you are and what you're doing you know thank you family man and and it's great and i thank think you. it's it's good for the listeners to be exposed to that yeah thank you because i think there's sometimes this false conception of this like this surgeon who's working on these celebrities we all the same yeah like you do a rhinoplasty on a celebrity you do a rhinoplasty on a non-celebrity still the same rhinoplasty yes, of course you know yeah i don't I don't spend more time or give more attention or anything now. They demand more of our attention, celebrities, or yeah. not even celebrities, like even just high achieving CEOs of companies, people yeah. that don't have a lot of time. They like want this, that. They have assistance. Everyone's more demanding. Some patients are just really easy. Yeah, yeah. And I've had some celebrities, honestly, that are easier than some of the moms of three that are housewives. <laughs> it's more personality, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, but yes, I have staff that I delegate to that, the celebrities and patients that demand more of our time and write 30 emails, you know, luckily I have staff that handles most of that. Yeah, yeah. But you do have to hold people in check. And one of the things I always tell everybody, especially those that are celebrity or very wealthy or something, I tell them, look, your body does not know who you are. Your body doesn't know that you're a billionaire. Your body doesn't know that you're this famous celebrity. Your body's going to heal how it wants based on your genetics and your anatomy and the best I can do for you. And we're human. Things can go the wrong directions. Your body's not going to say, oh, this I belong to this person, so I better heal fast, different, yeah. because she has red carpet coming up. Yeah. So I always tell them, look, your body doesn't know who you are. I will do my best. You're going to heal how you heal, and I'm very realistic with them. But some people, especially in Beverly Hills, are not like that. They'll say whatever they need to say to get that celebrity in. Yeah. And then I've seen a lot of people have problems and celebrities have major problems and they come to me for the revisions, especially really, really bad body work, really? like issues or starting to look very artificial or fake. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, the dermatologists just love pumping in all the fillers and making people look like pumpkins. Exactly. Um, and then they come to me to dissolve all of it, to replace it with fat, you know. There's a, you got to be realistic and you got to be honest. You got to be humble and you got to be number one. I think the best physicians and surgeons are human first, humanitarians first. And we always got to go back to the Hippocratic oath, which is that we have to do no harm and we're there to heal. Absolutely. Even if we're doing something quote unquote superficial as cosmetic surgery. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I always say, and when I'm along among brain surgeons and heart surgeons, I always say, look, what I do is actually one of the most honest forms of medicine because I'm not trying to code something to get insurance money. I'm not trying to do extra work because I need to make more because I'm not being paid enough by insurance. 
I'm giving you the best I can. This is the price. It's a fee for service. I will deliver. So in some ways, our medicine and surgery we do is one of the most honest forms. Yeah. And you can see it. Yeah, it's tangible. Right away. It's tangible and visible. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Yes. Does Ash Gavami like Salon? <laughs> <laughs> I actually prefer Martadella. Okay. Martadella is my weakness. I love it. Um, in Iran, back in the day, my parents told me they used to get this one martadella bologna uh, that was pistachios in it. Yeah. That they would get from, uh, I think most of it came from Armenia, a very famous nice. martadella called Mikelian is yeah. the name of the company. And they still provide martadella to the U.S. So martadella, a nice bottle of Coke, some nice pickles. That's my weakness. Salami itself, sometimes it's too hard. Yeah. It's like an indurated uh, revision rhinoplasty tissue. I like soft, soft pliable. I've got to, when you come to South Africa, you've got to try my brother's stuff. Okay. He's, he, he's uh, from Angus. He does incredible charcuterie food. Oh, that's my favorite. And uh, they live in a wine farm, spare wine farm. That's the best. In Cape Town. Yes. And, uh, we'll, charcuterie we'll, with the yeah. proper cheese and the good bread that's warm. Oh. And that's, yeah, I discovered that when I did um, Einkass about 10 years ago in yeah. uh, France. And that was when I really, truly had the best charcuterie. And from that point on, it's one of my pre-meal appetizers of choice. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Well, thank you so much. Of course. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Guys, thanks for tuning in to another program. And uh, Ash, thanks. And good luck for your next year as the president of the Rana Plastic Party. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.